Good morning. I'm Joe McCartan. I'm the executive director of the Kalmanovitz Initiative for Labor and the Working Poor at Georgetown University. We're pleased you could join us um, for this morning's important program. We were stunned by the response we received to the invitation we sent out to this just last week. Over 600 people have indicated that they want to join this discussion with us this morning. I think this shows us uh, how much hunger there is out there to grapple with today's topic, the impact of COVID-19 on workers across the world. This is an unprecedented moment, clearly. It's a plague that threatens working people around the world and especially puts frontline workers in danger. It's also an economic crisis, unlike any since we've faced since the Great Depression, impacting workers, impacting their unions, impacting the social structures that have been put in place over decades to provide security to working class people. The Kalmanovitz Initiative was established at Georgetown University 10 years ago to convene academics, activists, unionists, and allies to discuss the problems of the working poor, of workers in general, and to advance ideas to address those problems. Right now, we're engaged in a project called Bargaining for the Common Good, which we co-host with allies at the Center for Innovation and Worker Organization at Rutgers University and the Action Center on Race and the Economy. This is dedicated to reinventing collective bargaining to address the problems that workers face in the 21st century, to address big issues and problems, such as those that we're now confronted with by the COVID crisis. Later um, on, uh, in a little bit more than a month, we're planning a convening of people from multiple countries to discuss an action agenda to deal with the COVID crisis uh, through the bargaining for the common good model. We'll be in touch with you on that as we uh, formulate those plans. But today we're gonna focus uh, on the immediate problems that workers are facing around the world. Um, we have a distinguished panel to share their perspectives with us this morning. And to lead that discussion, we have a distinguished scholar, um, Leon Fink. Professor Leon Fink is an emeritus professor of history at uh, the University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, one of the country's most eminent labor historians. He's now in residence at the Kalmanovitz Initiative at Georgetown University. He's the editor of the leading journal, Labor Studies in Working Class History. And we're very pleased to have him with us, especially at this important moment. And so I'll turn now to Leon to introduce our panel and to lead this discussion. Leon? I'm, I'm okay, okay now. You're okay. good. Thanks, Joe, and thanks to you for uh, tuning in uh, to this webinar. It's been oft remarked on since the beginning of this COVID-19 pandemic, um, a, a basic paradox has been uh, uh, noted. On the one hand, uh, this pandemic um, keeps us all apart. We can't even see family and friends. Uh, and it, at the same time, we're aware uh, that, the, uh, that this crisis has brought us together uh, with shared experience across great distances that perhaps we were unaware of uh, that commonality before. That second realization has brought us to this virtual discussion on the global pandemic and its impact on workers uh, worldwide. Uh, for this forum, a distinguished panel of five experts experts mixing those with direct engagement with labor unions and grassroots labor and migrant rights projects and those who represent worker interests within their own national governments will look at the implications of the current pandemic <clears throat> the questions that i've asked the panel to address include these uh, what are the biggest needs now facing your country's workers both those still employed, as in the frontline healthcare sector or the service sector, and those suddenly unemployed due to business closures. Second, how has government action responded or not 
to the immediate conditions affecting your country's working people? And third, what further steps do you see as necessary, whether at the national or international level, to advance world recovery from COVID-19? Now we'll begin with our, our panel. Um, and we'll have a, a uh, each panelist will offer a, a brief presentation, then we'll move to discussion and uh, Q&A. Uh, and you'll notice on your screen, there's a, a, a ability to write in questions. We'll be taking note of those of your questions and then trying to address them after the panelists' presentations. Uh, Patrick Dixon and Lily Ryan of the Kalmanowitz Initiative will, will adjudicate the questions. So now to our to our panelists. As director the as as director of the International Department of the AFL-CIO, the U.S. Labor Federation, representing 12 and a half million workers, Kathy Feingold brings more than 20 years of experience in trade and global economic policy and worker, human, and women's rights issues. In 2018, uh, Kathy was also elected deputy president of the International Trade Union Confederation the organization representing 206 million unionized workers worldwide. Kathy? Thanks so much, Leon and Joe. Good morning to everyone, and thank you so much for organizing this event. I'm gonna speak with both of my hats today, both as a representative of the US labor movement, as well as the global labor movement. Now we know this is perhaps the most trying time for the global economy since World War II. The pandemic has affected every aspect of our life. The health and economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic highlights the employment relationships that were problematic even before the pandemic. We're seeing the fissures in the global workplace, the lack of paid sick leave, guaranteed hours of work, or even a formal work con contract. We're also seeing the existing inequalities that are becoming exasperated exaggerated and we see certain groups of vulnerable workers are um, disproportionately affected by the crisis in the US for example we're seeing how the pandemic is disproportionately affecting African Americans we're seeing how many of the economic programs meant to address the pandemic are leaving many workers out including immigrant workers so the lack of paid sick leave high levels of informal workers including workers who rely on platform businesses freelancers contractors and the self-employed underscores one of the main priorities we have as both the US and a global labor movement, which is we need to rebuild the social contract. So the pandemic is all about labor. It's about workers, the workers who are caring for the sick, keeping supply chains moving to provide essential equipment, harvesting and selling our food, teaching our children and providing transportation. It's also about the unions who are on the front lines representing workers and pushing for the needed economic and social policies, especially around health and safety. I think we've all been inspired over the past weeks that we've seen workers from Instacart, Amazon, leave their jobs demanding safer protections, demanding more power and voice on the job. And with the largest infrastructure in the world, the labor movement in the US and globally is using our structures to deliver food, trainings about health and safety, much needed relief to the unemployed and the sick, and to the many workers who've been left out of the economic support programs. Again, many immigrant workers. From LA to Toledo here in the United States, you see unions organizing food pantries. In Orlando, the union used its bargaining power to keep 45,000 employees at Disney on the payroll. Right now, as we enter a critical time of harvest in the United States, in North Carolina, the Farm Labor Organizing Committee, a farm worker union, is using its bargaining power to negotiate with the Growers Association of North Carolina to ensure that the immigrant workers who will be coming to the United States from Mexico and harvesting, uh, harvesting our food will have adequate protections, including personal sanitation and isolation facilities within the labor camps. 
And globally, I love seeing all of the work that's happening by the frontline unions. In Morocco, they're negotiating wage guarantees for hospitality workers. The South African clothing and textile workers union reached an agreement with employers to guarantee six weeks full pay for 80,000 um, garment workers as the country goes into lockdown. And in Honduras, we're seeing the day-to-day -day fight back in the maquiladora sector when the uh, employers wanted to use the pandemic as an excuse to fire union organizers. They launched a campaign. And finally, unions in France are creating domestic violence outreach posts. We know that the numbers of domestic violence are going up and it's, it's a huge problem for people in isolation. They're, they're putting these posts in supermarkets and pharmacies, some of the few places that are still open, so people know they can go there for safety. So workers are the most affected, and in many places where government policy, policies have left gaps, the unions are stepping in to provide these services. So let me start with a few examples in the United States about how the labor movement is not only providing these essential services, but advocating for much needed economic social policies to meet the needs of workers. So as Leon asked us to reflect on the government policies and actions that have been taken in the United States, I think many of us who have been in the United States have been following the very tumultuous um, process here in the US. Just today, again, we saw that um, about 6.6 .6 million Americans filed for unemployment benefits. We know that the real unemployment rate is likely about 13%. That means it's higher than at any point during the Great Recession of 2008. And these numbers underscore how workers need immediate intervention from Congress. Our livelihoods are on the line. So we recently passed the CARES Act, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. And there were a few positive things in there addressing the needs of workers. To be very clear, this is just a first step to address the immediate needs of workers. This is not an economic stimulus package. We will still need to negotiate that later on. But the challenge we're going to have later on is how, are, how do we want to rebuild the global economy? How do we want to rebuild it in a way that's based on the prior, priorities of working people and the needs of the environment? So the first thing the labor movement did here in the United States was we put together our priorities. We needed immediate relief, paid sick days, health and safety protections, especially the uh, personal uh, protection equipment. We needed to protect vulnerable communities, including immigrant communities. We also believe the government needs to address the immediate economic needs of the country, which meant maintaining wages and employment. I know we'll hear from other government representatives today. Um, and the really important tool that they have in other countries that we don't have here, which is social dialogue, the ability to bring labor, business, and government together to solve a crisis. We don't really have that system here, and that's something that we really need to think about trying to build during this time of crisis. So it's been harder to get some of our policy positions through. Um, for example, one of the ideas the labor movement has is how do we do short short-term work models like our colleagues in Germany. So some of those discussions we are still having, but they are more challenging here in a country with limited um, social, uh, social dialogue. So we know that the first CARES Act did not go far enough. Some of the gaps that we have identified as we start to negotiate a second round of um, government policies, there was no emergency temporary occupational safe and healthy standard or an increase in our uh, inspectors for health and safety. This is a huge gap at a time when we need safe and healthy workplace. There is nothing to expand the paid sick leaves. The previous uh, coronavirus bill left out workers at small and large businesses, healthcare workers, first responders. We need to fill those gaps. And we know that so many immigrants were left out of the US package. Um, it fails to ensure access to testing and treatment and benefits for immigrant workers. Uh, we know that any um, family that um, filed their taxes without a social security number will not get some of the uh, promised relief in the package. So again, these are key issues and there was nothing about worker pension. So thinking forward to our future. So in the coming days, we're preparing for another debate about expanded support for small businesses as well as a CARES II. Um, unions will be there fighting to make sure that, again, we have a vision for a very inclusive um, package for working people and that the economic um, supports don't just go to benefit the few at the top. Now, let me quickly just turn to some um, policies that are happening at the global level. 
the global labor movement represented by the International Trade Union Confederation has been surveying unions every two weeks around the world to survey how um, their governments are addressing the current crisis. Given the limited time, I can't go through all of the findings, but I encourage you to go really look at those surveys because they're very telling about how some countries have stepped up to the plate and then others are really falling behind and lagging. The International Labor Organization gave a stark warning this week with the projection of a decline in working hours, equivalent to a loss of 230 million full-time workers globally. We have yet to see the full impact on working people in the United States and globally. Since March 11th, more than four out of five people in the global workforce of 3.3 billion have been affected by full or partial workplace closures. Over half of the global workforce is already working informally, and many more are already working under precarious situations. We know that there are 150 million workers in global supply chains producing products for our own country. So when global demand went to zero, the first thing that major multinational brands wanted to do was not pay the people producing that. So we're in a campaign right now to make sure that, um, that they pay those workers. And of course, our biggest challenge right now is the failure of global leadership to come together and coordinate a response. The Trump administration currently chairs the G7, Saudi Arabia currently chairs the G20, and again, you can find the global labor movement's um, positions vis-a-vis -vis the G7 and the G20, but they are ab absolutely not showing the leadership that we need at this critical time. So what are we calling for? What are the demands and, um, of the global labor movement? First, rebuild the new social contract with a labor protection floor for all workers fundamental rights, adequate minimum wage, maximum working hours, health and safety, make sure that um, workers have the right to bargain collectively, have paid sick leave, make sure the care economy uh, has adequate support. We also are advocating to create a global fund for social protection. This re would require less than $5 billion a year to go to the 28 poorest countries in the world, $25 billion a year for partial support for low to middle income countries. Now is the time to build that infrastructure for social protection. We're creating a global framework to ensure that multinational employers pay their suppliers and maintain income and social protections for the supply chain workers from Honduras to Bangladesh to Cambodia that have created so much wealth for these brands. We are also pushing for investment in the infrastructure of the care economy. We know economies that are based on exports and when they lose those jobs, they'll be turning to the care economy. We need to make sure those are good, well-paid jobs with social protection. We need to coordinate supply at the global um, level for essential goods. We cannot continue the zero sum game of having our leaders pit countries and states against each other. All workers in the US and globally need these protections. Finally, we need to implement just transition measures for climate action and technological changes. We can't lose sight of the fact that our job after meeting the immediate needs of workers is to rebuild our global economy. We're gonna need a massive economic stimulus package. It should be a re-envisioning of this new social contract of our global economy. We're gonna to need to get a package of debt relief for some of the poorest countries to ensure that they can make it through this very challenging time. So I'm gonna leave it there. I think we have uh, a lot of work to do both in the immediate, making sure we keep those payrolls moving. And then at the same time, we need to start rebuilding a vision for the economy that we want that will finally work for working people and the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And uh, now we'll, we'll move on down the panel. Um, since September 2017, Lucia Ortiz has been the Counselor of Labor, Migration, and Social Security in the United States and Puerto Rico, located at the Embassy of Spain in Washington, D.C. As Labor Counselor, she collaborates on social and labor issues with Spanish, local, and international counterparts as well as developing international relations before the Organization of American States and other multilateral organizations. Her office also supports and assists Spanish immigrants in the US, providing information on labor, social security, and migration fields. Lucia? Thank you, Liam. Um, it's okay, everybody hears me? Well, thank you. Thank you so much and thank you for uh, all the technical work here. I have some issues, I had some issues on, on my 
connection. So first of all, um, thank you for, for organizing this webinar. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I would like to share some of my views on, on the biggest needs uh, and the national emergency regulations and uh, legislation improve um, to the lot of, of, of workers due to this uh, coronavirus crisis. Um, First of all, uh, just let me stress that uh, the coronavirus has staggered not only a health crisis, but also an, econo on an economic crisis around the world. Um, Spain has put in place, as many other countries, several actions at different levels. Uh, internationally, because overcoming this crisis will require a great deal more than a national response. Uh, within the European Union, we're working on as a solidarity mechanism to develop a common response and basically at national level to protect the population and the economy. And uh, on this regard, following the World Health Organization recommendation, Spain uh, is under a complete lockdown. A state of emergency was declared on March 14th and will be in place until uh, April the 25th at least. The central government has taken the lead in, in managing this crisis, implementing uh, health, economic uh, security and other measures. And 47 million Spaniards have been put under a complete lockdown with only a few exceptions. Um, addressing the workforce and the newly unemployed has also been a priority. First, uh, the key is to stay safe and healthy and to help flatten the curve as anywhere else. Uh, people's health and life come first, and then we will deal with the economy, rec economic recovery. Secondly, uh, to keep the economy going is also, also a key factor. And let me just focus some uh, ideas on this. The lockdown uh, for the moment seems to be effective. We uh, have switched the daily infl inflation from uh, a rate close to 40% at mid-February. And, and nowadays, today, it's 3.9%. Uh, uh, re this recovery uh, and this economy going has been through also uh, uh, with three government packages of economic measures. Uh, let me just refer very quick for this. Uh, the first one on March the 12th, the second one on March the 17th, and the last package on March the 31st. And through these is also uh, a lot of different other measures. Um, the largest mobilization of funds was on the second package. Uh, it's a comprehensive economic and social uh, measure that mobilizes up to 112 billion euros in guarantees and an estimated 5 billion in expenditures. And the last package is uh, what we call the social package has been adopted at, at late May. And it includes over 50 measures to enhance protection to vulnerable groups, such as tenants, self-employed individuals and businesses, with a triple aim of strengthening the health system, maintaining production, and avoiding inequitable outcomes. But focusing on, focus on workers that continue to work today, to the actual workforce, what measure has been put in place? Well, First of all, it was the teleworking and flexible schedule measures. Companies that are, uh, are promoting teleworking, which implies keeping the same rights for workers in place as a temporary and exceptional measure. The right to adapt or reduce working hours has been recognized for workers who demonstrate their duties derived from measures to combat coronavirus without limits and with 24-hour notice. Workers infected with the coronavirus or prevented, uh, in prevented isolation are granted sick leave, suffering from an occupational disease, which allows them to collect the benefits from the first day for a higher percentage of their salary and charge the benefit to the administration. Also, a program has been developed to allow workers to get for children, the sick and the elderly, so they can uh, reorganize their work or reduce their hours and salary accordingly. And uh, an extraordinary message was 
uh, put in place from March the 30th till today, April the 9th. Uh, Non-essential businesses have been shut down and only essential activity is permitted. Workers that cannot telework during this period will receive a recoverable paid leave. They may agree with the employer on how and when they will redeem paid working hours before December 2020. And now, of course, workers must be protected at work. Several measures on, on protecting um, our workers uh, during their duties, especially those on the front line, health workers, ERs, physician, uh, physicians, and essential services should have the PPEs available. As uh, so on April the 6th, uh, I have to recall that 19.4 uh, thousand workers in the health service with, has been infected with COVID-19. And what about the sudden unemployed? Well, the government has stressed that health crisis is not temporary, but excuse me, it's temporary and cannot be um, used to justify this myself. The challenge is enormous and the measures accordingly. First of all, we can highlight uh, a company furlough related to the coronavirus is considered first major. This means less red tape and keeping the worker employed six months after resumption activity, the resumption of activity. The companies that present this uh, fallout are released from the payments of the 100% of the social security contributions or 75% if they have more than 50 workers. All workers affected by these furloughs have the right to receive unemployment benefits. The time that the unemployment benefit is received during the fallout will not be factored into the maximum periods of unemployment and further, the benefits won't be counted in the future as benefits received. For the already unemployed before the state of emergency, the unemployment benefit will be extended ex officio, even if, they can, if, if it cannot be requested by the recipient or the required documentation is not presented within the established period. Additional social measures, well, may I stress the Roger decree that has been approved that includes the fairing social security contributions for uh, companies and for the self-employed -work workers. And it also contains this royal decree measures in favor of vulnerable groups, prohibits evictions to, uh, of tenants for six months, guarantees uh, utilities during the state of alarm, such as electricity, water, and natural gas supplies that can, the cutting off is prohibited, and uh, provides also 600 million euros uh, this time to finance basic benefits for regional and local social services, particularly uh, home care for the elderly and dependents. Also self-employed has been uh, covered for, with several other actions. Self-employed workers whose activity has been suspended by the declaration of the state of emergency or who suffer several losses due to the situation may have access to an extraordinary benefit, what we, should, we call for cessation of activities uh, and an employed benefit for the self-employed workers. These uh, self-employed workers are exempt for paying their social security contributions to. The, the ones, the, the uh, self-employed, the contract workers that continue working have been granted with some flexibility measures to pay their social security contributions through these referrals or postponements. And uh, one of the latest measures was this same week for uh, during harvest. Temporary hiring of unemployment has been allowed under advantageous conditions. Harvest is commonly in Spain assumed by temporary immigrant workers. Because of COVID-19, unemployed workers can be hired if they live in counties close to farms, and these workers will receive their salary, and which, it, it, which is compatible with the unemployment benefits that they keep, uh, they, they keep receiving. And the foreign harvest workers, the temporary workers already in Spain can extend their uh, work authorizations to this proposed. Uh, to give you a number of the harvest seasons normally demands between 1,000 and, and, and 150 
uh, uh, excuse me, 100,000 and 150, 100,000 workers. And of course, different industries can be also required to focus on the key production of several products like PPEs or masks, gloves, ventilators, or others. This is not a closed list of measures, but I would like to finish here my opening uh, remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucia. Um, now, our next panelist, Joseph Lau, is project researcher for the Chinese Management Association in Taipei, Taiwan. A longtime staff member in the country's Ministry of Labor, he is currently deployed to the Workforce Development Agency in the Ministry of Labor. Joseph? Professor Leon, um, fellow speakers, ladies and gentlemen, Moni, it is my honor to be invited to uh, this webinar to share the experiences of Taiwan on the prevention and control of coronavirus, as well as the government's uh, policies to assist workers and businesses during this difficult period of time. My remark will include uh, four sections, and the section one will be a brief introduction of Taiwan. Section two will include measures of uh, COVID-19 control. Uh, section three uh, will include the challenges faced by workers and businesses, as well as the government's um, responsive policies to COVID-19. And uh, section four will be the conclusion. So uh, now let me begin with the first section a brief introduction of Taiwan. Um, Taiwan is located in East Asia. It's about 110 miles, it's 180 kilometers of the southeastern coast of mainland China. So we have a population of 23 million people and with an area of 36,000 square kilometers. So it's actually we have a high density of population on the island. And Taiwan is also a trade-oriented economy. So uh, section two, I will discuss the measures uh, by Taiwanese government in, in uh, dealing with the COVID-19. Taiwan has established a public health system with the national health insurance which provides a universal coverage of medical network to almost all the citizens in Taiwan. Since we have a frequent contacts and exchanges with mainland China in business and trade, we have been observing closely the development of the, the coronavirus in main, mainland China. As early, as early as January this year, uh, two Taiwanese doctors were sent to, main, to Wuhan to conduct a preliminary uh, understanding on the actual situation there. Soon afterwards, Taiwan's government began to take the measures to prevent and control the coronavirus. At the same time, uh, Taiwanese people uh, began to wear face masks in public places such as public transport shopping centers, uh, supermarkets, and offices, which means that public awareness has been uh, raised. As of today, April 9, 2020, without a lockdown in the country, we have 380 confirmed cases with five deaths of coronavirus disease. While Taiwan has been trying to prevent and control the COVID-19, we have been working closely with the international community to combat this disease by sending uh, uh, medical supplies to international partners and allies. The third section, I will discuss the challenges faced by workers and businesses in Taiwan, as well as the government's uh, policies as a response. For the information, most businesses and industries are still operating normally in Taiwan. 
However, since 97% of the businesses in Taiwan are small and medium enterprises, SMEs, so it is true that many workers do face a reduction in income due to the less amount of working hours. There's also another small percentage of workers who have lost their jobs due to the occurrence of coronavirus in the service sector, especially because of the less number of customers. So as a response, Taiwan's government has announced several measures to assist workers and vulnerable vulnerable groups. For example, for unemployed workers, the government offers six-month six short-term jobs with a minimum wage of, to help uh, unemployed workers to maintain the basic living and short-term job. Also, uh, unemployment allowance is open for application for up to six months. As for workers who are on unpaid leave, the government also offers the subsidy of 40% of salary for three months. At the same time, the government also encourages workers to participate in vocational training programs and also the uh, vocational training allowance is uh, granted to help them maintain the basic living Meanwhile, the low a low interest loan is also open for application to workers in need. As for the self-employed workers, with the minimum, uh, as for the self-employed workers with an um, um, monthly income of, on the minimum below the minimum wage, the government also provides subsidy of up to three months. The government also encourages businesses to hire the grad college graduates who are scheduled to graduate in June this year. If the businesses are willing to hire the graduates, the government will provide subsidy of up to 50% of salary for a period of one year. So uh, amid this challenging situation, Taiwan's government has announced several measures to assist workers across uh, all sectors as well as vulnerable groups to maintain their jobs and basic living. And as a conclusion, I think that since the coronavirus pandemic is a global issue, it relies on international cooperation and mutual assistance to combat this disease. Governments around the world are recommended to continue playing a key role in helping the workers and businesses, especially the workers, to maintain their jobs and basic living during this difficult period of time. As a member of international community, Taiwan is willing to help and work closely with the international community to safeguard the rights of workers and help combat the COVID-19 disease. So uh, that's all for my opening remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph. Uh, uh, now, uh, our next panelist, Anya Vailer scheck currently serves as counselor at the German Embassy in Washington, DC. This capacity as labor attache she manages the portfolios on labor, health, and drug policy, on migration, as well as on social affairs, religion, and gender policy. From 2012 to 2017, she headed the Amman Jordan office of the German Friedrich Eber Stiftung Foundation and was responsible for the organization's work in both Jordan and Iraq. Anya? Like many countries around the world, um, Germany is suffering from the crisis. Um, we currently have the fourth highest number of infections worldwide. Um, there are extensive restrictions in place. All our states have imposed stay-at-home orders, like many have in the U.S. 
and many businesses are suffering, especially the food service industry, the non-food retail sector, and the related industries, as well as the arts. But of course, this is a global um, uh, phenomenon. So with regard to our response, um, international coordination and cooperation is essential to us. And um, we also work um, very closely with the member states of the European Union to address the issues that all our members are facing. When you look at our national response, um, it is important to keep in mind the system that we have. By um, its constitution, Germany is a democratic and social federal state and places essential value in the principle of solidarity. Uh, Germany therefore has um, an extensive social safety net providing unemployment benefits and social security. Also, the German labor law, for example, provides for paid sick leave. And uh, Germans are obligated by law to have health insurance, so we basically have universal coverage. This means that while the corona crisis is, of course, an unprecedented challenge for all of us, we were able to build our response on this foundation. There are already structures in place which enabled immediate implementation. And um, through our system of social partnership, the social partners, meaning the employee and the employer uh, representatives, not only negotiate with each other, but are considered key stakeholders by the government. The unions are an instrumental player in negotiating and coordinating the labor market response. So from the very beginning of the outbreak, our trade union leaders participated in crisis, crisis meetings of the German government. Uh, so um, looking at unemployment caused by the current crisis, it is still too early to assess the impact that this will have. We're still at the beginning of the crisis and no one can tell how long it will last. Our um, current unemployment is at 5.1%, but we're expecting an increase throughout the year as our GDP takes a hit. I'd like to point out an important instrument that Germany is employing to mitigate the labor market impact and to avoid um, mass layoffs. It's called a uh, Kurzarbeit, a uh, short-time working allowance. And it was first created during the financial crisis of 2008 and nine. And back then it very successfully softened the blow to the German labor market. The way it works is that when working hours are temporarily scaled down or reduced to zero, employees continue to be paid they receive 60% of their previous salary or 67% when they have children. Companies can apply for these funds for their workers from the government. And um, through this instrument, um, employers receive support for their labor costs and are able to hold on to their staff. For um, the current corona crisis, the threshold for applications was lowered and the instrument expanded. And in March alone, 470,000 companies requested short-time working allowance for their employees. The unions welcome this instrument to support companies and their employees, but they criticize that, especially in the low-wage sector, the compensation is not enough for people to cover their monthly payments. In some sectors, the compensation is therefore being topped off through collective bargaining agreements. One example is the recent agreement that the metal union negotiated in several states. A few days ago, um, an interesting modification um, to the instrument was introduced. Uh, recipients of short-time working allowance are now allowed to work on the side. Uh, however, this only applies to jobs that are deemed system relevant, such as farm work and harvesting or care and health related work. And there have also been uh, some uh, creative approaches in the private sector. McDonald's, for example, has entered a partnership with Aldi, one of, the, uh, one of Germany's um, big grocery retailers, and uh, McDonald's is now lending staff to their stores. So it's a win-win. McDonald's has significantly fewer customers right now, whereas grocery stores are experiencing very high demand. An important point that I would like to point out is that um, a crisis usually uh, points out possible uh, um, points out and possibly exacerbates certain problems in a society. One uh, very relevant example is the situation of health and geriatric care workers. Uh, Germany, like many countries, has been experiencing a, shorter, a shortage of workers in this field. And uh, wages are comparatively low there and working conditions often very straining. So recruitment has been difficult. 
And many employees in this field were already working at the limit even before the crisis. Um, but there is hope that this crisis will serve as a motor for collective bargaining to negotiate new wage schemes in these crucial sectors. And uh, one final remark, um, uh, it's maybe preaching to the choir, but unions are as strong as their membership. And it's no secret that union membership has been in decline in Germany as pretty much anywhere else in the world. But, is it, but it is times like these that really demonstrate how crucial unions are. They are um, the collective voice of employees. If they don't raise awareness regarding employee needs, no one will. And maybe you can draw an analogy with health insurance. If your job goes well and you don't have any problems, you might think, eh, why pay union dues? But when things get difficult, you're glad that someone's got your back. So the union is your insurance that someone will speak up on your behalf. Plus, when you are doing just fine, others might not. So your contribution will always also be one of solidarity. And lastly, German unions usually hold big rallies on International Labor Day on May 1st to raise awareness about labor rights. And for the first time since World War II, these rallies had to be canceled this year, but they will take place online. And this way, maybe they will even have a more global reach and will bring together workers worldwide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anya. All right, our, our final panelist um, is J.J. Rosenbaum. J.J. is the U.S. Director for Global Labor Justice, a strategy hub supporting transnational collaboration among worker and migrant organizations to expand labor rights and new forms of bargaining on global value chains and international labor migration corridors, with particular attention to the garment, food supply, hospitality, and global labor subcontracting sectors. JJ? Thank you, Leon. Thanks to the Kalmanowitz Institute for creating this opportunity and to all the distinguished panelists. Um, <clears throat> so at Global Labor Justice, we're uh, trying to look at what's happening in at least two phases. The first is the immediate crisis response uh, to the quarantine, uh, which is having different effects on different kinds of workers, as many of the uh, previous panelists have discussed. For food supply workers, they're working harder. They're um, being, in some cases, pushed and coerced to work without uh, appropriate uh, pr protective equipment um, to keep the supply chains running. Um, in the manufacturing sector, particularly in the garment sector, for example, as Kathy mentioned, uh, we've seen um, broad cancel immediate cancellation of orders that are already in process and people being pushed out of work. Um, so we're seeing uh, <clears throat> different realities similarly in the hospitality sector, um, a, a vast uh, a problem of no work uh, for many union members and non-union members in the sector. Um, and then the second is the upcoming recession um, and the change in the global economy that will happen even after this uh, urgent uh, quarantine is, it comes to an end. Um, and so I think it's important that in our asks for government and, on, and to employers, um, we're thinking about both of those levels. Um, as Kathy mentioned, um, there's been a strong um, progressive response that labor has played a key leadership role in, um, in trying to create strong, um, a strong, relief for workers and for to have that be very inclusive, as inclusive as possible. While there are still many <clears throat> fights to be had, um, it's a, I think, a uh, far step forward that, that uh, relates to much important organizing that's been happening for many years to make that possible. Um, I think we've seen uh, a less clear uh, demands around the global economy. We've seen less clear um, demands on the state in the United States for what should happen on supply chains. Uh, and we've also seen, um, we've seen an abdication of role by many global brands um, for what should happen to the workers that are farther down their supply chains and in other places. Um, so as we know, supply, the supply chain business model is such that production is broken down um, into supplier contracts. And those are, um, and, and, and small and medium sized enterprises are made to compete for those contracts often um, bidding at rates lower than the cost of what it takes to make the goods. Um, and then that creates 
competition for the most vulnerable workers, often women, often migrants, often workers in employment uh, arrangements like contract work or informal work or homework. So we have a very imbalanced system. That also means that countries are competing against each other for lower labor standards um, and environmental standards or, or ineffective enforcement of those standards, which drops labor costs. So this is the structure on any day of the year. And this is the structure we're trying to respond to when we think about workers <clears throat> that are in those countries. It's also a system where the profits and the value are being sucked <laughs> out to the top and out to other countries. So this means that countries that are heavily reliant on global supply chain jobs have less money in their system, in their uh, social safety net systems to be able to try and experiment with some of the things that have been discussed in Germany and Spain. Uh, and so I think this is why um, it's gonna be really important uh, that we don't forget that the state um, is not gonna be a sufficient response for everyone. States have important roles, um, but the, given the inequality in states <laughs> and the way global, uh, system, global economic systems are working, there will be a role for brands um, and particularly U.S. brands in many sectors to take responsibility for workers that are outside the United States, but are nonetheless dependent on the business decisions that they're making. Um, and so I want to um, encourage everyone who's all the 262 people <laughs> that are on the call and the 700 that signed up to be at the ready um, as some of these asks are coming forward from the ITC, um, from groups like Global Labor Justice and Partners, uh, because this is a moment where we, um, as, as all the colleagues have shared, we have to see ourselves as a global labor movement uh, and we have to have a really inclusive understanding of what that is and understand that um, the impulse that some will have to become very uh, nationalist um, is something that we have to reject. Um, and I think it's really, it's particularly important um, to note that, that um, there have been um, xenophobic and racist discussions about supply chains in the context of China um, and that uh, there was already uh, a competitive advantage that was dropping given that wages in China are going up, uh, but this may adjust and shift how companies think about their supply chains, um, given that there may be stability in China sooner on some supply chains um, as opposed to other places in the United States and Asia. Uh, but it's important to watch and monitor um, that as we're thinking about um, very reasonable attempts to make medical equipment available and be, have a more, um, more grounded economy that we don't um, fall into anti-Chinese racism um, as part of those discussions. And we don't um, have competition. There have been discussions about um, you know, Mexico competing for work that was in China that have fallen into some of these uh, sorts of xenophobic and, and racist discussions. So we wanna, as the labor movement, be really clear about avoiding that. Um, I think, you know, the, it's, it's really important also at a, at a narrative level that as we ensure that governments take responsibility for people in their countries, um, that we don't uh, separately um, use language that, that suggests that we're not, we're not interconnected <laughs> and that there isn't supply chain responsibility across uh, borders. Uh, and so I think that um, talking about, uh, as the ITUC has led on talking about a social safety net and social contract with parity demands. If you're a worker, doesn't matter what country you're in, you need certain things. And whether you know, the government provides things, your employer provides things, those may not be exactly the same in every country, but you still need them as a worker. And it shouldn't be that if you're a worker in Germany or the United States, you're getting a much better support than if you're a worker in India or in Bangladesh. Uh, and I think as a labor movement, we can model some of that, um, some of those demands in important ways and that will lead us forward. Uh, I think, you know, uh, I think this has also been mentioned, but it's really important that we um, monitor that employers are not using the current quarantine or the coming recession as an excuse for anti-union activity, that layoff, we, we're already hearing reports of layoffs um, targeting union, um, known union activists and union leaders first. Um, we've seen traditionally um, and seasonal work that rehire often means that union activists are not rehired. And so I think we have to, uh, both with governments and with employers, with all of our social partners, really be emphasizing the importance of freedom of association and calling this out when it's happening. Um, and on supply chains, brands at the top of supply chains have to be responsible <clears throat> when this takes place at supplier levels and not turn a blind eye. Um, so I think I would say in closing, 
um, you know, that it's a very difficult time, but it's also, we have to see the opportunity um, to strengthen our institutions. We're seeing, um, as, as uh, Kathy and Anya, and Anya spoke, the importance of labor movement structures at every level, at the local levels. Local unions are the ones that are actually knowing what's happening, uh, providing immediate humanitarian support, like figuring out PPE solutions, uh, you know, at the national level, how unions are coming together, regional level and global level. And we have to continue to strengthen and build those structures and use the opportunities, for instance, of things like social, social um, supports that come through the state um, and using ideas like co-enforcement such that unions are playing a role in the distribution of that and the bringing of people in of the monitoring of gaps um, or of lack of enforcement um, of those programs and are able to strengthen unions and worker organizations even further. Um, we have to continue to push a broad and inclusive agenda. Um, and I think the ITC again has really modeled this and there's many great examples, but we have to include migrants. We have to include women. We have to include informal sector workers. And this is, work, is important work, whether we're trying to get undocumented immigrants into the US CARE Act or we're trying to make sure that money that will come from the international financial institutions on down is including migrants and is taking into account people that are in a country that is not their home that are, uh, that are moving back and forth in ways that are different than what was expected. Um, and finally, again, I think we really need to um, just continue to hold corporate demands and responsibility throughout this. Um, obviously, um, there's a change in the economy and it's, it's different than what was expected, but we're also seeing, I think, a manipulation of that in many ways, the immediate cancellation of contracts for consumer goods that are still being sold um, and the leaving of small and medium-sized enterprises unable to pay their workers, unable to pay their bills for things that have already been produced. Um, it, we, we can't um, let that stand and we have to be able to speak out and say that we are all gonna be good social partners and we're all gonna be responsible um, in this moment. Uh, so maybe I'll close there and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very, thank you very much, uh, JJ. Uh, all right, uh, so I wanna thank all our panelists for these uh, very stimulating opening uh, comments. And I'd like now to <clears throat> move to uh, discussion and to, uh, to a bit of a Q&A. Uh, uh, I'm gonna um, uh, start with a question and then uh, and throw this out to the group and then uh, we'll take other questions. Uh, after this one, I'm gonna ask um, uh, my friend Patrick Dixon to perhaps uh, offer, uh, to, to chime in with any other questions that he feels have been raised uh, that we need to address. Uh, otherwise, we'll talk, uh, we'll let the panel itself um, engage each other. But I want to bring in this question from uh, uh, my colleague and distinguished uh, labor and women's historian, Eileen Boris from Santa Barbara, California. Eileen um, points out that care and domestic workers are often left out of many labor laws, including OSHA in the US, and COVID-19 relief is no exception. Um, she asked the panel to please discuss more about these frontline workers, that is um, care and domestic workers um, uh, uh, deemed essential, but often laboring without protections or without work due, without work due to the fear of the spreading contagion. Um, I ask, um, you know, our, our international common commentators, Lucia, uh, Joseph, and Anya, uh, for their, any, any response to this question? If I may, Leon? Yes. Lucia? Please. Well, this is, of course, uh, these sectors, these, uh, these workers are, are essential that come, they, they come into our homes and they, they protect our, and they care for, for the people we love, for the elderly, for the people that are disabled many times. Uh, in Spain, uh, I can talk uh, of this measure uh, that has been uh, put in place uh, concerning the domestic workers, an extraordinary unemployment benefit because the regular, in the regular, um, in the actual regulation, they don't have, they don't have the unemployment benefit. 
But because of the impact, of course, of this uh, terrible crisis on their job, uh, they have put in place this new exceptional uh, unemployment uh, benefit, which provides them during the state of alarm in which they cannot work because these people cannot telework. They cannot work from the houses. Uh, provides them a, a subsidy of uh, 430 uh, euros uh, per month. I, I know this can be a, a minor uh, amount uh, be related with uh, the high standard uh, living and, and salaries in the United States, but in Spain, this can you know, uh, help and help a lot to these uh, special special groups uh, regarding uh, and, and and this other part of the question is is just what i i can see and and follow through through media and through the news from spain uh of course the 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 elderly care uh and uh, the nurses uh have been specially hit and uh, hit it but by, uh, by, by by the the coronavirus and i've seen many examples of people working in this in these places that they, they have been uh, especially compromised with the elderly and many of them, they decided to stay and, and be in the lock during the lockdown, be and stay with the elderly and not the, let them uh, just by their own. They, they are committed people. And they, I also want to stress that uh, our, our special uh, measures concerning disinfections uh, has been also very focused uh, on like like our 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 uh, army and and all the the the, the forces and, and the armed corps they've been disinfecting many of these elderly homes which sadly have been one of the of the uh, focus of the of the points of the hot points of of uh, contagious contagious and disease of the diseases and and some of the of the deaths thank you so much thank you <clears throat> anyone else want to comment on this topic kathy is my phone is that okay is the sound working yes. great thank you yeah. so much i think i was cutting in and out my apologies for the last round um, so the global labor movement, absolutely. I think this is a really important question. We are one of our demands at the uh, global and national level is investment in the care infrastructure and in the current packages that are moving. We are trying to get all workers um, uh, covered, um, which is one of the big challenges. Um, our statistics show that if just 2% of GDP were invest, invested in the care economy, overall employment could go up by 1.2% to 3.2%, creating 24 million new jobs and reducing um, the gender employment gap. Um, currently, the International Trade Union Confederation is planning a global day of action around the care economy. We're about to release a toolkit to help unions around the world implement um, care economy policies at the national level during the current crisis. And then we're gonna be training. We have um, webinars coming up to train our movement and how to ensure that the care economy is indeed part of our demands going forward in the, in the immediate, in the workers who get coverage in the policies that are being put forward, as well as this vision that we're gonna to continue to push forward, which is where we wanna be um, post pandemic and the kind of employment relations we want to, um, to create uh, in our new economic system. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, anybody else on this one? I think I'll move on then. Um, uh, okay, I have, uh, I'm gonna, offer these three questions that have come in, uh, but they're somewhat related and they're all fairly specific in, in their uh, the question, in the, their points. Um, uh, Rosemary Sokas from Georgetown asked about Taiwan and Germany. Would Taiwan and Germany have supply chains to provide healthcare workers in Africa? Um, uh, with specifically reusable elastomeric respirators, face shields, powered air purified respirators, and the training and supplies to clean and maintain them. How might governments, particularly in Africa, access these supplies and expertise? And then I'm going to read two others. Historian Angela Vergara, so asked, 
I would like to know more about how different countries are enforcing health and safety protections for frontline workers um, and whether the coronavirus is considered generally considered a work hazard with workers entitled um, thereby to special compensation. And then the last question here um, from um, Tim Beatty of the Teamsters Union directed directly at um, directly for uh, uh, Joseph Lau uh, from Taiwan. Um, do the income supports you described apply to the large immigrant community working in Taiwan? Would you describe the Taiwan's government's measures to assist immigrant workers in your country? Okay, those are three fairly specific questions. Might we, uh, uh, might you be able to offer a response um, from the panel? Uh, okay, yes. Thank you, Professor Dio. Um, so, which question should I start to answer first? Your choice. Uh, yeah, no, okay. uh, um, I will start answering the first question as for how the countries in Africa should, could have access to the medical supplies that we offer. Um, at the moment, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Taiwan has been uh, has been uh, engaging with uh, international partners and allies, different continents. And if there is a, a there is a need in these medical supplies, perhaps the governments in Africa could contact our overseas diplomatic missions in Africa and to see if they could uh, exchange the views and seek assistance from our Ministry of Foreign Affairs. That's the, for the first question. And for the second question, how Taiwan's government provides assistance to the frontline workers in the health industry and other industries. Um, we, usually provide um, the pro personal protective equipment, PPE, such as the face masks, and uh, the, a, a, fu a full-scale uh, full clothing for healthcare workers and hospital staff, doctors, nurses, for them to conduct a daily work because they are the ones uh, combating the diseases and also for, for workers in the healthcare industry to take care of the vulnerable and elderly. As for the third question, how Taiwan's government uh, provides uh, measures to assist the large amount of immigrant workers in Taiwan. Um, at the moment, uh, due, due to the challenging situation of coronavirus uh, pandemic, all the visas for immigrant workers in Taiwan are automatically extended for 90 days, that's three months, so that they don't have to travel uh, uh, back and forth uh, between Taiwan and their home country, which is also a way to help them avoid the possible infection during the travel. Uh, in addition, uh, we provide a, a uh, a free toll hotline, which is uh, 24 hours, seven days in multiple languages to offer consultation and inquiries from these immigrant workers. Or if they want to uh, have any inquiries or complaints or consultation, they could dial the hotline at any time, any day to seek assistance. Also, our a Bureau of Labor Affairs across the different cities in Taiwan will conduct regular visits to the immigrant workers who either work in the social welfare industry, this is the health healthcare, or the manufacturing industry. The our officials from local governments will conduct regular visit site visit to uh, to to chat as to 
to see how the, the working condition is. And it's also a measure to ensure that they, have, they work in a safe work environment. So it's basically the measures Taiwanese government currently uh, offers for the immigrant workers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would anyone else like to, to jump in on these questions? Yes, uh, Leon, I'm, I'm happy to. I think there were um, uh, questions also uh, addressed to Germany. So um, uh, on the um, point of um, providing support to uh, vulnerable countries, um, of course, this is uh, an issue very um, uh, close to our hearts. Um, I think it is crucial and that we coordinate closely with our international partners and uh, coordinate among donors and also um, address the specific needs um, in, in order to avoid uh, duplication. There are um, structures in, in place such as uh, the WHO and I think um, it is very important that we use um, uh, these structures to address uh, countries in need. And there was also another question uh, regarding um, hazard pay for um, uh, those workers uh, that um, work in, uh, in healthcare and in geriatric care. Um, uh, Germany is currently um, discussing a different system of bonus payments uh, for, um, for these workers. Um, as with um, uh, gear, um, uh, it is of course um, uh, an, a difficult issue for, um, for all countries right now. Um, we're doing our best to provide um, all um, uh, workers with um, PPE uh, that they need. But as I mentioned before, I think this crisis um, uh, can serve as a motor for uh, long-term collective um, bargaining uh, agreements that address um, the needs that were there before the crisis and that now um, become um, particularly obvious. So um, let's hope that this will be uh, a chance also to drive forward these um, uh, agreements. Thank you. Um, Kathy? Un unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Oh. What? We're, we're not hearing Kathy. I'm okay, not. can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Sorry, I'm uh, using multiple devices here to be heard. Um, so the, I just wanted to give a perspective from the, um, from the AFL-CIO that we're currently um, trying to highlight the issues that just want to respond to the question around health and safety for frontline workers. The Center for Disease Control actually has been putting out standards that are harmful to um, our frontline workers, and so we're currently in the process of trying to um, raise awareness around that, make sure that the CDC puts out better um, proposals about how to protect um, workers from the airborne transmission of COVID-19. Um, we also are asking our government to make sure they federalize the process for getting personal protection equipment to frontline workers and not pitting states against each other. And, and to Anya's point, we need a global solution to this as well. We can't be pitting countries against each other. Um, and so um, we are very concerned about the U.S. government response to the frontline workers' um, health and safety issues. And the AFL-CIO will, will be putting out a statement in this respect um, in, uh, today or tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I guess I, I'd like to uh, use my prerogative to ask our panelists a, a question, if I may. Um, uh, I have two, I have one specific question just out of curiosity um, to, for Joseph and Taiwan. Um, uh, I think we're all just amazed, astounded and as well as impressed by the um, effectiveness on the health, just on the basic health statistics in Taiwan of the way that the country has managed to keep um, infections and casualties down. Um, I know this, this may not be specifically a labor question, but I'd like Joseph to address, aside from the early use of masks, uh, what else is Taiwan, do you think, explains its relative success in dealing with this crisis, just at the basic health level? Um, and uh, the larger question uh, for the panel is this one. Um, uh, in the U.S., uh, on the one hand, our bodies of government are at least talking to each other now, uh, uh, and the Congress 
is getting through a bit, um, particularly the Democrats in the House on legislation, but um, it's still a nasty business at the political level. Uh, no one is in doubt about that uh, in dealing with our president. Um, but I'd like to ask um, in re regards to the case of Spain, where Lucia laid out a, an elaborate set of government responses and benefits. In the case of Germany with the Kurtz Arbeit system and the principle of solidarity, as well as in the case of Taiwan. Um, what about at the political level in these three countries? Is, is there been a, a rough, has there been a consensus since COVID-19 across the political specter or has there been in, bit, in continuing bitter divides as we experience in the United States? So Joseph, would you want to take the first? Uh, sure, thank you for, Leon, uh, for your question. Um, as for the, in uh, 17 years ago in 2003, um, Taiwan experienced the severe acute respiratory syndrome, which is shortened as SARS. Uh, at that time, there was a certain amount of casualties and life loss in Taiwan. So after that, we uh, started to uh, enhance our public uh, health system by building the medical network uh, and also some uh, to, to uh, create more uh, clinical beds for respiratory uh, uh, patients for, for their treatment in hospitals. And so when the COVID-19 occurs earlier this year, um, when a, pa when a patient is con confirmed for having the, the coronavirus, he or she is uh, automatically transferred to the quarantine hospital um, for further treatment. And also uh, all the, the domestic uh, travelers coming back from, all, all the Taiwanese uh, nationals coming back from overseas are requested to uh, be self-isolated for 14 days as a period of observation. Um, at the same time, the government has been uh, uh, recommending the public to maintain personal hygiene by washing hands frequently and maintain social distancing and also uh, wear uh, masks. So, when the public awareness has been raised, most of the people are fully aware that this is a, a difficult period that we have to pay special attention to in cooperation with the government. And in the political spectrum, so far there has been a little division on different sides of political spectrum on the measures of disease prevention. Also, uh, so that's uh, my uh, response to your questions so far. Thank you. Thank you. So would others like to take up my other question about the, the politics and COVID-19? May I, Leon? Please. Well, um, thank you very much, and 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 thanks to to uh, the rest of the panelists also for the for the interesting uh, information. Uh, well, I think in the case of Spain, uh, we have like two two sides. On one side, the civil society, which is giving you know good lessons and and an extraordinary uh, commitment with the with the lockdown. Uh, generally speaking, Spain is one of the most um, solidarity um, societies. I mean, uh, there's the civil movement that uh, has been raised like spontaneously. I don't know if you've heard about these people going every single day <clears throat> to their terraces and balconies to give a big applause to the frontline workers, uh, meaning from uh, 
from from uh, health uh, to to the uh, supply chain you know every single evening you know at spain at 8 p.m uh, all families get out and and, and give this a tremendous applause on the other side we have uh, of course the, the politics which uh, works very differently uh, first of all we we have the uh, the first state of, of alarm in, in our democracy and, and a very tough situation. Even the curve, it starts to flatten. We still, you know, have an enormous n a number of, of infections and of cases, more than 150 up to today and, and more than 15,000 uh, casualties, which is uh, very, very sad. Um, I think at a political level, the message has been uh, to, to stay together and to give you know, Spain a, a good response, and then we will have time to debate on how the things were made. Eventually, there's, as in any, any other country, there's a very intense internal debate already. And uh, of course, during the state of, uh, of, of uh, emergency, uh, the, the government is, uh, constitutionally can, can approve uh, different measures that have to be afterwards passed by, the, by Congress. And uh, in Congress, it, we have a you know a tough debate on, on, on the measures that have been that has been taken. Uh, even the actual government is offering you know a state uh, approach. They want to give like a state uh, a state pact on on the on the future um, management of on all this. Uh, we we are talking about a new. What we call Pactos de la Moncloa, which were the pacts that helped Spain the transition between the early democracy to a more consolidated democracy, and uh, and a lot of you know essential measures were were adopted by every uh, most most of, of 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 the of the parties in Parliament. Our Parliament has multiple parties, not only a a, a majority party, a minority party. Uh, party. So um, just to, uh, as a conclusion, it's, um, it's very difficult. There, there are a lot of criticism on how things are um, put into place, or if it was too early, it was too, too late, if uh, the lockdown was necessary, if the, uh, what, what, what would happen after the lockdown. All these things are uh, controversial. And as you mentioned, the uh, the deal uh, or the, the negotiations uh, on on Congress on the different institutions are are quite difficult in this moment. So I guess um, we we will love to to see you know that we have a common uh, approach and uh, we have a common response and and, and common um, let's see approval and. Uh, that's that's my my point of view of how things are doing now in Spain. Thank you. Thanks, Lucia. Uh, how about in uh, Germany? Well, um, uh, thanks, uh, Leon. As uh, Lucia said, um, you have to look at the uh, difference in the political system. Uh, we have um, a multi-party um, system, and so um, usually um, a negotiating compromise is is um, a key of our political system, and it has been really um, uh, very interesting to see um, uh, uh, parties uh, rally around this challenge. And um, if you look at the polling, uh, very interestingly, um, uh, the uh, government has um, experienced a surge in their approval ratings uh, uh, among uh, German citizens and um, is uh, currently faring very high. And 72% of, um, of citizens are expressing uh, confidence in how the government is responding uh, to this challenge. Thanks. Um, and Joseph, what about politics in Taiwan? Uh, okay. Um, in Taiwan, uh, we have a semi-presidential political system. Uh, currently, the Democratic Progressive Party uh, is the majority, the party of majority in parliament, and also uh, takes the presidency and the prime ministership. Um, of course, there have been some suggestions from opposition parties that to recommend that the government should uh, expand the range of testing on the coronavirus uh, as, as a way to safeguard the public 
from the virus. Uh, uh, but uh, basically, the, the approval rate of the government's measures has been uh, quite satisfactory and high among the public opinion. And um, just a uh, let me see was yeah just a month ago the parliament passed the bailout package uh, to uh, help the workers and SMEs to uh, so that they could uh, uh, maintain their jobs and income during this uh, extra uh, this difficult period so and so far there has been no large division on political views in Taiwan regarding the, the prevention control of the coronavirus measures. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, JJ. Thanks, Leon. I just wanted to jump in and say that um, as we go forward in these conversations, um, it'd be great also to pull up to the table folks uh, representing uh, more developing countries because I think the responses, um, you know, there are very different constraints. Um, there's also very di potential difference for creativity and innovation. Um, and as we're in a discussion about labor, like it, it's really important that we're remembering that our labor markets are increasingly interlinked. The financial markets that are driving the global economy are interlinked. Um, and so while, you know, historically this is a state-based responsibility for social contract, the reality is we're gonna to have to think about that in a much more robust way. If we wanna build, um, as several commenters have been noting, build something that is more robust in the future, build the system that we should have, not get back to you know, ground zero with the ineffective system that we have now. Yes, thanks, JJ. I wanted to um, keep the focus on your uh, expertise for a moment, because we've had three questions that have come in more about the relationship of the global north to the global south. Uh, one uh, uh, comment raises the question of um, what is being done that would af could affect the great informal sectors of workers, uh, particularly, you know, it's a category we're familiar with, particularly for Latin America, vast numbers of landless people, people with, who are not part of official systems of social security and benefits. Uh, in the third world. Um, uh, what about, uh, someone else asked, um, uh, the problems with uh, global so supply chains. Um, how can, um, how will we be able to put pressure on, uh, uh, as one, as a writer writes, bad multinational corporate actors, uh, or how will, what kind of act actions um, will these workers be able to engage in? Would you want to take that up? Sure. I mean, others may want to also join in the question about the broad informal sector. Um, but I would say that the the point of inclusivity in in the definition of worker for in order to earn social protection has to be very broad. Um, and I would also just say that I think the categories are increasingly blurring, and so there are, you know, informal employment relationships in the formal sector. There are, you know, there are informal sector workers, home like home workers at the bottom of the most traditional formal sector. And so I don't think this is a, um, it's not like out of a spirit of charity <laughs> that we need to think about the informal sector. Um, it, for the reasons that uh, Elaine mentioned earlier, it's very important that we like think about this interrelated. And that just means at every step of all the work we're doing, we have a very broad employment definition and then that we actually do the work to make those systems work and reach everyone, which will look different in different sectors and different countries. Uh, to the global, like how do we, uh, how do we know uh, which companies may be not living up to their, their professed public values and how do we hold them accountable? I would say um, stay tuned on some of that. <laughs> I think there will have to be, um, you know, some, some asks or demands that are put out there um, and I think in different sectors, these are coming together in different ways. Um, uh, and so I think if you follow the ITC, the AFL-CIO, Global Labor Justice, um, there are a number of, you know, uh, Unite Here, IUF, there are a number of um, unions and, um, and labor groups that are, that are thinking some of this through and trying to set that up. Uh, so just ask everyone to stay tuned um, and keep that as a part of the, 
you know, map that you have and the things that you're working on overall. Thank you. Kathy, yeah, please. Thanks so much. I just wanted to build off of, of JJ, JJ's good comments. Um, again, my apologies because I know I was going in and out um, with my sound. I want to just emphasize that we are actively pushing the international financial institutions um, and other uh, multilateral organizations to create a global fund for social protection that would include informal economy workers as well. So I wanted to make sure that that is a huge target. We're trying to um, raise $5 billion a year for the poorest 28 countries that have a majority informal economy workforce. So that's just one of the um, current initiatives that we're working on um, around global supply chains. Um, I would push all of us right now. Um, to JJ's point, we are um, trying to create a global framework currently around um, apparel. We also think that a framework needs to be built around other supply chains like electronics, the food um, supply chain. Um, I think it's never um, too soon for these companies to hear that you're very concerned that they um, may not live up to their commitments to the supply chain. Um, we got to see this in two phases in terms of the supply chain. One is the immediate. Just like in the U.S. and in other countries, we must ensure that there is income support policies in place for workers in Bangladesh, Cambodia, Honduras. And then the next stage, um, we need to figure out what happens if the supply chains permanently leave a country, right? Because of the decrease in global demand, um, how will these global supply chains shift? What will be the new sources of employment in these countries? Um, again, back to our discussion around the care economy. So um, I would just say that I think uh, you will be hearing more from us soon. There's already some um, materials that we've, we've put out around our demands on global supply chains. Um, we are asking all multinational employers to respect um, international labor standards, national law, and ensure that there is income um, employment, in, income protection programs in place during this pandemic. Thank you. Um, uh, well, we are approaching the end of our, our own uh, time for this uh, webinar. I, uh, I wanna give um, a last, uh, chance to my colleague, Joe McCartan from KI, if he'd like to um, offer a, a, a final thought or question, uh, and then we will move to a conclusion. Joe? Thank you, Thank you very much, Leon, and uh, what an what a extraordinary discussion. Um, I want to first thank my colleagues from the uh, Global Health Initiative at Georgetown who co-sponsored this event and helped publicize it. We're deeply grateful to them. We host a weekly call um, with our, those colleagues, including people in labor and occupational health. Uh, and anybody who's interested in joining that call, um, please contact us at lwp at georgetown.edu. Um, so the, the thing that I'm thinking about as you're all speaking is that this is a unique moment in world history um, and, and for workers especially. Um, Kathy referred to not since World War II has any event so broadly impacted people in the global north, the global south, uh, all around the globe, the developed and the developing world. Um, it seems to me that what this moment has done and several panelists have remarked on this is really brought to the surface some of the weaknesses that have developed in the past half century in the world economy within our nations and across nations. Weaknesses that have um, led to workers not getting their fair share of growing world productivity. Um, and one thing I think we don't want to do uh, is only aspire to stopping the bleeding, so to speak, and returning to the status quo ante of this uh, experience. We have to, I think, even in the midst of this moment, start to envision the kind of world that we want to, to fight for um, and to emerge from this. I think one thing that we're going to be faced with, certainly in the United States, but in many countries, I think, is uh, calls for a return to the austerity politics that we were struggling with uh, after the Great Recession. We're spending a lot of money in the US now trying to simply stabilize things. Some people will try to take advantage of that to say we can't afford anything else uh, in the world after COVID. And so part of our thinking, I think, needs to be how are we going to fight against this 
return to austerity. I'm wondering uh, if the panelists can um, maybe speak for us for a moment in conclusion about the coming of May 1st which has global significance for labor movements everywhere. And is there a way in which we can begin to think about this date coming as a way to lift to the surface some of the, the, the aspirations that workers have beyond COVID um, to, to try to address some of the things that you've all been talking about? Thank you, Joe. Um, would anyone, uh, uh, Anya, uh, already in, I thought I took. I thought she already invited us to the May Day celebrations in, in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do think Joe's point is very well taken. I'm I'm sure Spain has a a a a, a, a very vivacious May Day planned as well, or normally does. Um, but uh, but I think that the idea of seizing on this moment to take advantage of the connections that we're making here and that people are making in many other venues is all to the good. Um, I, I hope that we can. Does anyone want feel they want to say, sign off with any further comments? I don't. I think Kathy was going to say Kathy? something, Kathy. Thank you. I can't resist when May Day is mentioned, obviously. I, I you know, want to say that this year we're going to face um, two big challenging big days. One is April 28th, which will be Workers Memorial Day, which I think takes on even greater importance this year as we will be unfortunately um, looking at the loss of many lives of, of workers. And so that comes April 28th and the global labor movement is organizing around that. On May Day, we have um, the intention of raising up workers who have been excluded. And we've talked about this on the call, um, immigrant workers, which traditionally in the US has been a day of action and mobilization for May Day. So we're hoping to continue that. And then there are um, actions that will be um, supported by unions globally that will be on platforms, which I'm happy to share with folks. If you follow at AFL-CIO Global, we will be coming together around May Day. And I, I just wanna end on you know Joe's great point. Um, one thing that is different um, this time around having been in the fight after the 2008 Great Recession, I was heartened to hear the chief economist at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development actually say, now is not the time for austerity. And that was something we didn't hear back then. Um, I'm hoping it rings true um, because you are correct, though. What we don't want to hear is workers going back to the bargaining table and hearing there's, you know, they can't raise wages, improve uh, working conditions. Um, during uh, you know the, the coming months post pandemic, now is the time to start dreaming big about the new the way we want our economy to be shaped, deep in the priorities of working people and the environment. So thanks so much for organizing this today. Okay, well <clears throat> thank you. I want to thank all of our uh, panelists. Uh, did a great job. I'm gonna, the the uh, staff from um, the Kalmanovich Initiative. Uh, and our, our many participants and your questions. Uh, to all of you, uh, thank you. We hope to continue these efforts um, in the coming months. Uh, we'll sign off for now. Thank you.